You're listening to Shakespeare's Sonnets Exposed, Episode 3, Sonnet 2. What if I say I'm not, not like, like the others? others? What, what if I say I'm not just another not one in your place? place? You're the pretender. What if I say I will never surrender? Once again, I'd like to thank my patrons for their contributions, and more importantly, for showing faith in a project I've been obsessed with and possessed by for years. For those of you who've recently joined me on this adventure, this is a re-recording of the original Sonnet 2 episode into audio podcast format. It's easier on the eyes, easier on the ear, and is considerably more complete. Please keep your suggestions and criticism coming. I'm going to begin this re-recording with a revelation that I've recently had. The word sonnet means little song, a meaning which Shakespeare relies on often throughout the sequence. But in context of the sequence, it also means little son, as in a little replacement of his lost son, Hamnet. Right, let's analyze sonnet two. When forty winters shall besiege thy brow, and dig deep trenches in thy beauty's field, thy youth's proud livery so gazed on now, will be a tottered weed of small worth held. Two important terms in this opening quatrain are besiege and trenches, ideas that will come up again in Sonnet 5. As an older man, Shakespeare will be able to read these sonnets and see his own youth reflected in their writing, just as a father sees his youth reflected in his son. At age 40, Shakespeare's brow will be wrinkled, which will show as trenches in his skin. For the sonnets, their words are entrenched in the lines across the page, and they have a mission to infiltrate the reader's mind which is located behind the brow. Alternatively, and in line with the farming metaphor from Sonnet 1, Shakespeare has used his pen to plough furrows along the page in which the words will be cultivated. Each sonnet produces the seeds that will then be planted in its successor. The word livery came from the old French for delivered and came to mean servant's clothing, which is still in use today. So the youth's proud livery is what younger Shakespeare is delivering to older Shakespeare and the reader, the sonnets, as well as his physical body that clothes his spirit and the words that clothe his intentions. Totted weed, or tattered weed, is an interesting image. It's an expression that works as well for worn clothing as it does for crumpled paper, but as the sonnet sequence is represented by the rose, we are here presented with an image of a young, proud rose contrasted with a tattered weed. What Shakespeare and the reader are holding is the sonnet that reflects Shakespeare as he was when he wrote it. But time will pass, and the sonnet will become like its creator, used and discarded. This is only the second sonnet. By the time Shakespeare produces a fortieth, he'll look back on this one as old and obsolete. At the same time, when the reader gets to the fortieth sonnet, he won't be sparing this one a second thought. Then being asked, where all thy beauty lies, where all the treasure of thy lusty days? Lies has two meanings here. The first being in the sense of one's final resting place. Hamnet is in the grave. Eventually Shakespeare will be too, and his spirit will be buried in the sonnets. The treasure of Shakespeare's lusty days was Hamnet, and the lusty days themselves, which he's now investing in the sonnets. The lusty days of the sonnets, however, are the days when Shakespeare was alive. Just like Narcissus' reflection, once Narcissus dies, the reflection's lusty days will be over. The word treasure is fascinating. It means the same thing we use it for today, a quantity of valuable objects, but is derived from the Greek word thesaurus, which also means storehouse. Shakespeare's treasure, the sonnet sequence, is a storehouse containing his reflections, his spirit, his most valuable words. To say within thine own deep sunken eyes were an all-eating shame and thriftless praise. The expressions deep sunken and all eating, evoke an image of worms eating a body in the grave. The eyes refer to Shakespeare's reflection in the sonnets. Where Narcissus' reflection is submerged in water, Shakespeare's is submerged in ink and parchment. If Shakespeare were to tell people that his spirit, his son, and his legacy were buried in the pages of the sonnet sequence, it would be a shame, just as if the second sonnet were to eat his words and not lead on to more sonnets. That would be terrible. But at the same time, for Shakespeare to say that his all had been invested in the sonnet sequence would be wonderful praise for the sonnets, perhaps even excessive. 
Thriftless implies wasteful, waste being a term used quite a few times throughout the sequence, and praise meant to attach a value to. To read these lines with Shakespeare being interrogated, if his answer was that his treasure was in his own eyes, as opposed to in his son or in his sonnets, that would be shameful and narcissistic. How much more praise deserved thy beauty's use, if thou couldst answer, this fair child of mine shall sum my count and make my old excuse, proving his beauty by succession thine. Shakespeare's beauty is not his physical beauty, but his intellectual and emotional beauty. Beauty's use is the sonnet sequence. Not only is it Shakespeare's beauty given form by the sonnet, but it's the sonnet given function by the reader. The sonnet sequence is the sum of the individual sonnets, and far more important and valuable than the sonnets is their combination. As I've stated before, the sonnets simply cannot work well in isolation. They must be read together and in sequential order as a single body of work. They are the representatives and the embodiments of Shakespeare himself. This expression also anticipates the language of auditing in Sonnet 4. The word excuse meant, and still means, to free from blame. This sonnet will literally make Shakespeare's excuse for him, excusing his lack of a son by serving in his son's place. Deserved meant served well. So in this sense, Shakespeare is serving his son itself, his son, and his legacy by answering this fair child of mine. Shakespeare will be proving or demonstrating his beauty in the sonnets, both by writing it into sonnet two and by writing more sonnets. The other way to read this quatrain is with thou referring to beauty's use, the sonnet. With that in mind, how much more praise deserved thy beauty's use, if thou couldst answer, this fair child of mine, is saying to the sonnet that it would deserve even more praise if it would have a succeeding sonnet to answer with. This were to be new made when thou art old, and see thy blood warm when thou feel'st it cold. Each sonnet is, like a child to a parent, a copy, an iteration. So when an older sonnet sees a younger, it will be reminded of when it was fresh and relevant. Or when the reader moves on to a newer sonnet, they will be presented with a younger, fresher sonnet than the one that they read before. For Shakespeare, and for the reader, the old sonnets will be a window through which we can see Shakespeare's youth. As ink is the blood of the sonnets, it is cold when it is dry, but what we are seeing in the words is a frozen image of the moment when it was warm and being placed by the quill. While the sonnets have been recognized and adored by scholars and fans the world over, they haven't enjoyed the same kind of mass appeal as his plays, and Shakespeare's intention for his works was always to appeal to a broad cross-section of society. It is my aim to rescue the sonnets from obscurity, from the darkness, and to that end I am producing a graphic novel adaptation, recording these podcasts, and tattooing 154 images representing the sonnets onto my body. If you haven't already, then please sign up to support me at www.patreon.com slash fisherking. And please join our community discussions on Reddit at slash r slash sonnet comics with an X. Thanks for listening. What if I say I'm not, not like, like the others? others? What, what if I say I'm not just another not one in your place? place? You're, You're the, the pretender. pretender. What, what if I say I will never surrender? surrender.